Hi there, welcome to Nomadic Diaries. We're the podcast that takes you on journeys through the lives of those who have already embraced the international lifestyles. Whether you're an expat, a digital nomad, or someone who's dreaming of those lifestyles, this is your passport to a world of insight. We dive deep into the hearts and minds of the overseas lifestyle professionals, the authors, and researchers. Join us on this fun adventure as we deconstruct all the elements of expat and nomadic lifestyles, one captivating story at a time. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. This is Doreen with Nomadic Diaries. It is my pleasure today to introduce you to Maria Garita Nandia. I'm doing my best, Maria. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doreen. It's a pleasure to be here. So Maria specializes in global leadership development training and coaching. She has over 20 years of experience working with clients in Latin America and the U.S. at all sorts of levels uh, of responsibility and across many different industries. She offers her clients solutions in leadership competencies, including intercultural and global team management, effective communication, and coaching. Welcome, Maria. Thank you so much. Well, we know that this is a big job. <laughs> <laughs> tell, sure us, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your background and what drew you to this work in uh, cross-cultural experiences? This is, it's very interesting. I was born in, in the U.S., but my parents were the first wave of Cuban immigrants to leave, thinking that they would be back within months. But after the Bay of Pig invasion, they realized they were never going back to Cuba. So oh. I am first generation U.S. born. And my father, when I was very young, was transferred to Italy as a, an expat. Uh, I remember my mom saying to me, we're moving to Italy. And I'm like, what's that? <laughs> and <laughs> yes. there's Scooby-Doo there. Can I watch Scooby-Doo there? Of course, of course. Well, of course, there was no Scooby-Doo <laughs> yes. back in the yes. day. But yes. we moved to different countries, Italy, Puerto Rico, Mexico. So I spent a good ten, 10 or 11 years moving from one place to another. And mm -hmm. that made an impact because I really loved it very much and thought that I would go into foreign service. Yes. <laughs> I studied international relations, but life had different plans for me. So I wound up in Mexico, married to a, a Mexican friend of mine, raising my kids. And eventually when I went back to study my master's, I discovered cross-cultural management. It mm. was a relatively new field of study. And I realized that I had a vocation for it. Yes. And I researched it a little bit more. And I started working for some companies as a subcontractor. Mm -hmm. while also teaching negotiation skills and uh, all kinds of different leadership skills. So I was able to fuse my love for all things intercultural with leadership and eventually came up with this, I guess you could say a hybrid, where now I am dedicated to helping leaders in different parts of the world who also have virtual teams in yes. all parts of the world and have, yes. to, be, have yes. to be effective. So that's yeah. pretty much where my career path took me. <laughs> well, that's very exciting. So, so you were able to parlay your experiences of being the child of an immigrant, the cross-cultural experience between Cuba and the U.S. and Italy and then Mexico into a career. And so congratulations, because I believe the more people we have in the field who are heart-centered and really connected to the human experience across cultures, the more you can help sew the world together, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so. so tell me, how does the, the unique background of someone like yourself, how does it contribute to uh, your, your belief in the potential of global leadership? 
So you have all these little humans who are growing up as um, little children, and many of them are now, we're now in the third or fourth generation of this. My daughter was a third generation TCK. I'm wondering, how does that background contribute to that potential? When you have to be the new kid Mm. every every couple of years, and you Mm. have to be adjusting and adapting so that you won't feel left out or excluded, you learn real fast that there are things that you have to start doing. Yes. Then I would say, as you probably know, and your daughter probably knows, that, that your identity can be pretty fluid in certain senses, that you might be considered the nerd in this school, and then guess what? You're going to move to another place, and you're like, you know what? I think I'm going to experiment, see if I could be a jock, or see if I could be you know, one of the popular kids, or see... but the way that you figure that out is by learning how to observe, mm. picking up real quick on what the dynamics are that you are seeing, listening to the language. I can tell you in one school I learned really quick. I came from one school where the kids used profanity a lot. And then I moved wow. to another school where that was not cool because it was a yes. different culture and you don't use profanity really quick how to adjust even my language or the words that I was using what was considered cool or interesting in one school was very different from another if you look at it from a macro level when we are going from one culture when we're talking about corporate culture to another corporate culture there are also these ideas, these clicks, these environments where we mm-hmm. need to learn what is going to be re- uh, recognized and mm-hmm. rewarded and what will not. So anybody who is in a leadership position working, perhaps moving from one industry or company to another will would probably benefit from a lot of these skills that you learn at a very early age as a third culture kid. So how would you suggest that third culture kids articulate these skills? Because um, I think what we see is that there's lots of people out there who have these innate leadership skills, but they're kind of invisible. I call them superpowers. (laughs) But if you put superpower on your resume, I don't know how far you're going to (laughs) get. So so, um, talk to me about that part please do you mean about articulating it as if you were selling yourself or do you mean how you use them in a particular case well um i think that's that's a even better question because i think in explaining to other people who you are Mm -hmm. and why you are without getting the entire story which no one has time for um is is a skill in itself. I think the articulation of the experience and the meaning that was built into that experience is important. Yes. And that brings me to my famous quote unquote disclaimer method that I usually recommend leaders use, especially when they are having to work with a new team, a new group, especially if they are of a different culture than them. Mm -hmm. I was just recently coaching a new CEO from one country, and she was going to be working in a a new Mm -hmm. country. And she knew that she was probably going to be coming into the job, being a little bit more direct in her style, the people who she was going to be working with. And that is something I'm pretty familiar with, because being a Cuban American kid <laughs> who eventually, as I grew, I, I learned that, for example, the time the time that I lived in Mexico, people are a little more subdued and diplomatic than yes. my family was. So I had to learn to give a, a type of disclaimer. So what is my disclaimer? It's yes. basically when you're working with a new group of people to talk about what the rules of the game are. So in academic terms, you would talk about the meta talk, right? We're talking about how we're going to talk. 
Mm-hmm. But a disclaimer is basically to give people the heads up. Hey, you know what? Let's not ignore the fact that we're coming from different frames of references and culture. Mm-hmm. I'm aware of it. I have the best intention. It's important to state your intention. I have That's the best great. intention. I want us to work well together. I want to make sure that we create synergy. And we have to realize that we are coming from different frames of reference. Please. Let us make sure that if there is noise, we can sift through the noise and clarify and move forward. And I usually tell people, look, there is a a possibility that that nobody will call you on it, but they'll remember it and they won't take things personally when there's a little bit of that dissonance. In giving your disclaimer, it feels to me maybe you're doing several things. You're sort of setting a vision or a goal in a way of harmony without using the word yes and you're also describing a, a little bit about this vague um the, the the difference of experiences and how vague it is is that correct yes because if you ignore it it's going to come back to bite you in the butt is what i say you can't ignore it. If you ignore it and you assume, you know what they say when you assume, right? Yes. So yeah. if you go ahead and keep assuming that everyone is going to process the same way you do and react the same way you do, you're yeah. going to be in for a, a cool awakening. So yeah. it's very important to address these issues, especially in the beginning. And the sooner, the better, because then that way yes. people remember it and they feel more comfortable addressing things when there is that yes. conflict, right? Yeah. So tell me about some of the specific leadership competencies that you find are um, in TCKs compared to uh, monocultural populations who are very rooted in one place. Well, it has been said that third culture kids do tend to to have certain abilities in leadership. And I would say the first one, simply being able to be more observant, probably contributes towards situational leadership, being able to realize in what circumstances you need to be more focused on relationship and in what circumstances you can be more focused on tasks. So just having that possibility of discerning when to use one style versus another probably comes from having to be the new kid every time you have to switch schools, right? Sure. The observational piece for sure is there. I would also say that the, the flexibility, the flexibility and also being able to be more sociable and win people over. Third culture kids tend to learn how to make friends quickly. It is also, I guess, yeah. one of these uh, adaptability things that yeah. we learn. So we tend to we tend to solve things by trying to win people over. You know, in the disc, we, we are usually high in the influence yes. thing. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So, yes. So that's important, uh, being able to to pick up on the energy and the vibe, being able to speak to people in their language and by language, not just literally, right, (laughs) but also figuratively, being able to pick out maybe somebody who's a little bit more of an introvert and connect that way and maybe somebody who's more Mm -hmm. of an extrovert. Mm. And connect using their language, uh, adapting the style, the language. All of these things are key. I think that any leader who is successful usually has that ability to adapt and adjust. I was listening to the radio yesterday and um, they were talking about uh, CEOs and the the place of the modern day CEO uh, in relationship to the upcoming political elections in, in the U.S., I was surprised to hear several people say that some of the many of the CEOs in in the corporate world are just wonderful people who have good intentions at heart for a lot of people. And I thought, hmm, I I wonder how that relates to TCKness. I don't know. I honestly, to be honest, Doreen, 
I'm an optimist in the sense that I believe in the goodness of human beings. I do. I do believe that most people are good, regardless of I whether, agree. whether they're CEOs yeah. or not. I think that most people don't yep. wake up in the morning thinking how they can be a jerk, <laughs> but rather thinking, right. let me see, right. I'm doing my best and I'm a good person and I'm trying to be considerate, etc. I don't know if TCKness <laughs> has contributed to that, to that, but I think that seeing that there are good people all yes. over the world opens you up and you realize that the, the human heart is good. And you focus on that. I think it's not, it's, it's not just the awareness of it. It's the definite paying time, attention, detail, and energy to that fact that makes a difference, right? So how does that look for you? How... How do you help people and organizations enhance these global leadership invisible skills that they have? <laughs> mm. Well, just what we were just talking about, it, depending on your perspective and how you approach things will make a huge difference. I mean, if you if you approach your team, for example, I was coaching another woman and she was frustrated because she had a new team and granted that the situation was stressful we're dealing with you have to deal with a lot more with less a lot of times in, yes. in the organizations yes. she was frustrated yeah. because she was finding that many people in her team were resisting change and they mm. were not very motivated etc but instead of looking at it from the point of view of oh my goodness how frustrating and these people just don't get it and they, they, mm -hmm. us, us. It's important, especially when you're at, at TCK, you learn that the division between us and them is not really as defined as you think. So changing the idea of us versus them, those silos have to disappear. It's important mm -hmm. to see that it's we're all us we're yes. all one organization. Yes. It's not it, operations versus sales. It's not, we're, we're all part, right. we're trying to move towards the same goal. So I think starting with that and realizing that everybody is probably wanting to do their best. They're just, sometimes there are circumstances or sometimes even the way that you talk to each other, you're coming from a stressful situation mm. and instead of being vulnerable and doing the disclaimer you could start off with the disclaimer of you know we're facing a lot of difficulty right here and I'm, I'm I'm a little frustrated because I don't know how to move forward I yeah. have the best intention please tell me how we can make this better and it makes a huge difference it, and that's like uh, Brené Brown talks about being vulnerable all the exactly. time we're talking about these silos and do you have uh, two or three or just two things that help to dissolve silos? Obviously, this disclaimer starts to disarm people. What is the next step after that? Or what might be one of the next steps is, is better? The vulnerability piece is important. The disclaimer is important. I also recommend taking the em the empathetic step a step further in a more practical sense if it's possible i i i largely recommend for people to understand where their stakeholders are coming from so for example mm -hmm. uh, uh a person who's in charge of it, the integration of a, a large telecommunication company mm -hmm. she was telling me that her internal client which are the project managers they have a lot of conflict. And so she says, I know I should probably go and talk to them and go sit with them. And I said, that's a great place to start. It, yeah. It's like, yeah, but I don't want them all to gang up on me. And I said, you don't have to do that either. But why don't you just go one by one and talk yes. to them? Because they were off to a bad start. They were having yes. they were the same company, but they were having. A, yes. A, so sitting down and, and, Again, saying, listen, how are we going to solve this? We need to work together. We're just really, it's the wear and tear is getting to be too much. It's not sustainable. <laughs> how can how can I get to understand 
where you're coming from, what your barriers or or, mm-hmm. or difficulties are, but not at the expense of me having to to also have to sure. so many barriers. How can we make this a win win? Sometimes and- sitting down and talking more honestly and frankly is more important because people tend to focus on the problem, but it, yeah. but like I told her, this is really not about the problem. You're annoyed because of the approach that this person took with you originally. Mm-hmm. And it's not, you're not really focusing on the problem. It's about the relationship. So yeah. you can't ever forget that there's an underlying relationship thing that you're not talking about. And, you know, I am thinking about the, some of the audience who listen to this podcast Many people are um, expats who have left, who have been in corporate life for many years and who still have that wisdom and experience locked up inside of them, but are now living, um, say, in Mexico or Costa Rica or Portugal, uh, one of these places, as a different choice outside uh, of their native country. And how they too can use this, because this is just very practical and very, very, it seems very loving advice in a way. Interpersonal relationships <laughs> to develop. I mean, it starts with emotional intelligence. Of course, we talk about cultural intelligence, interpersonal intelligence. It's having the social awareness Yes. Of knowing when and where to say or do certain things. Yes. And how to approach whoever it is that you're interacting with. Yeah. In a way that will be well received. Yeah. And what a gift that is. Whether you're a a TCK or not, whether you are an expat or not. I mean, that's, that is advice that we can use, it seems, just on a day-to-day basis. Yes. <laughs> with our families, right? <laughs> Starting with our families, perhaps. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> you, talk, you bring up the subject of families, and um, often it's families that precipitate this c- cross-cultural experience. It can be a cross-cultural family, fr- um, parents of different nationalities. I'm in a cross-cultural relationship got a Scottish person married to an American. And um, even after we're coming up on our 40 year anniversary. Wow. But I still go, wow, that that's a cultural thing. (laughs) (laughs) That and 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 I see how ingrained it is. Those 40 years that we've lived together around the world have sort of built up an armor that looks like different flags and different cultural experiences. So I'm just really curious as as to how you suggest that we um, build childlike curiosity and maintain that childlike curiosity, because I think it's easy to generate it for a minute. But it's tiring to generate that long term. So talk to me about childlike curiosity. That's great. That's a great question, because it seems that children are like little sponges from the time you see toddlers, they're imitating us. And sometimes you realize that they're imitating things that you shouldn't be modeling. So yes, yes. Uh Oh, I just saw something reflected back at me that I shouldn't be showing. But I mean, if you just observe the way that children's eyes light up, I'm thinking, and I remember back when my kids were little, and I and I learned from my daughter. She was raised in Mexico. And yes. it's very funny because when she went to visit her aunts in Philadelphia, she would she would call me and she's like, I'm mad at my aunt Beba because she's joking about me. And I don't like the way she's joking because it was a little bit of a sarcastic humor. And sometimes humor mm-hmm. doesn't really translate. Like, translate in the yeah. same way. And yeah. it was so cute because she's she would say, I know what you're going to say, mom. I know that this is a cross-cultural issue. And yeah. I understand it in my head, but it still bothers me. <laughs> so yes. she would just, she was so cute. And I mean, she was a, 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 a teen, a young teen. 
it was very interesting to see how even in her in her young age she was so it was easy for her to distinguish between what right. was cultural and what yes. was personal right and she was yeah. she was very self aware she's like i know that this is something that that, that is normal but it's i can't help it it still bothers me and i know that i can't take it personally but i'm mad <laughs> so. but that's great that she had the self awareness to do that so that's related to being a childlike. I, I think is is it also part of living in the now? Because children live in the now. Does that help our curiosity? I mean, what what is going to help grow our curiosity so we're really genuinely interested rather than fake interested? What makes that's a great question. I don't know. What do you think? I have no I, idea. I, I, I I think maybe living in the now, I think that I, I could do better at that. Um, I think many of the people I surround myself, we we can, all of us can do better at that. And that's one of the reasons I play pickleball. Ah, okay. Very therapeutic. <laughs> hey. well, well, yes, I, you yeah. are in the, you are in the moment and you can, and in pickleball, you have to just react and, it, you know, it may not be the right thing to do. But it is living in the moment, and I think that living in the moment can bring us joy. What do you? What else could we do? I agree, and I think that the I've been noticing. I, I don't know if you have, Doreen, but I've been noticing a lot more that, for, it, for example, in social media, even in LinkedIn, I've been noticing mm -hmm. a lot of people talking about, "Hey, you know what? It's important to be mindful. It's important to not just." Be swept yeah. away with the with the frenzy of social media, even though you're probably looking at social media telling you you shouldn't be looking at yes. social media. Yes. But, <laughs> but I, I can tell you that I have definitely be, tried to become more aware that, that, of course, there's many things vying for our attention. But at the same time, sometimes we just need to put all of the devices down and enjoy that moment with the mm. kid, with the grandkid, with the spouse mm -hmm. just looking at looking at the beautiful environment every time mm -hmm. i go back to cornavaca it's like my heart grows again just looking at the beautiful fruit trees and the bougainvillea and oh you know i just, yes. I just breathe easier and i think that moving from one place to another even as you know as a as a third culture kid or even as an adult you realize the beauty of our earth you need to appreciate that the people and the beauty of the place and the beauty of the diversity that that exists in our on our planet right and that's i think an, another part of the a childlike curiosity is living in awe yes and 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 it rained here last night and we have been we the, we have just had two three of the hottest months on record in this city in the mountains 6600 feet high and uh, it's almost like you can feel everybody in the planet and every leaf is just breathing better today wow <laughs> yes that's life coming back at you <laughs> yes it is it's just wonderful so this has been a great conversation thank you so much maria it's great to get to know you and to and to hear about your experiences of growing up now Tell us, where can people find you if they're looking for you? And I will put this in the show notes. Oh, okay. Well, you can find me either on LinkedIn. Uh-huh. Yeah, go right to Nandia. And my website is called globalbridgestraining.com. Globalbridgestraining.com, everybody. This is where you can find Maria and we can um, and stay in touch with her. Make sure you reach out because clearly... She has a lot of uh, experience and a great depth of knowledge in this subject. Now, just before we close, I have a question that I've started asking. If you were to grant people, not just expats and, and nomads, but if you were to grant people who are moving around the planet one superpower, what one superpower would you grant them? I like the idea of being able to look into people's hearts it would mm. probably solve a lot of mm. mis misunderstandings and conflict. Yes, that yes. Wonderful. Yes, so spotlight into people's hearts. And um, if you were to take a particular food 
with you. If I banished you to a, a, an island for a year <laughs> or forever, what one food would you take with you that really symbolizes um, your joy of being alive and, and eating? Okay. Uh, I, there I would have to go to my parents' culture, Cuban culture. Uh-huh. And it would be the, the, the guava pastries, the pastelitos de guayaba. They are, and I eat them every, anytime I go to Miami. They are delicious. <laughs> Excellent. Pastelitos de guayaba. Yes. Gracias. Thank you. you know <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for this, Maria. This has been delightful. And we'll make sure that um, we encourage the audience to go and find you in the show notes. Thank you. Sayonara, masalama, and hasta luego, everybody.